We're going to move now to hit the other end of the chain, the supply chain, to the, the breeder side. And I'm, I'm pleased to be able to welcome Dr. Tosca Ferber, who's research director at Doom and Orange. Uh, Tosca has worked in the past in the vegetable breeding industry, has come across into ornamentals industry. And although the, breed, the breeder level is a long way, away from the consumer and yet they have to be able to respond to what the consumer is doing and they are able to respond increasingly fast to uh, changes and trends and to be able to bring new products to the market. Tosca is going to tell us how and we're very pleased to welcome her, Dr. Tosca Ferber, thank you. Yes, well, thank you, Tim. Um, I'm really excited to be here today to tell you more about what we do at Doom and Orange, uh, although it's a slightly intimidating lineup to be, to be part of, I have to admit. Um, so I'll be telling you today about how we are preparing the industry for a greener future. A greener future. Um, and for those that do not know Doom and Orange, we are uh, one of the major breeding companies in the ornamental industry. And very specifically, my research team is responsible for developing novel traits for the industry and also innovating the breeding pipeline that we use to create those new varieties. And when I talk about a greener future, I'm obviously referring to sustainability, as we see that sustainability is becoming a more and more, more important pillar of our society. And uh, we see numerous national and international initiatives already popping up where the complete value chain is collaborating to make sure that we are producing plants in a sustainable way. And this morning already the Furriculture and Sustainability Initiative was mentioned. Um, but there are more initiatives out there. And, but what we also see is that this dot on the horizon is slowly moving because it seems that we need to be sure that we are um, creating plant varieties that are also fit for this more sustainable production. And we see that a solution for this sustainable production can be found in specifically breeding varieties that are resistant to pathogens and more resilient to diseases. We can learn a lot from what has happened in the vegetable industry and the row crop breeding industry. And for instance, in this middle graph, you will see, yes, so sorry, I am a scientist, so I will be bringing quite some graphs today. Um, but what you see on the graph, uh, on the y-axis, you see the average number of resistances in a tomato variety over the years. And you see that by the, the time this publication came out, already six variety, uh, six resistance genes would be available in an average tomato variety. But what you also see as an effect of that, that the industry has been able to reduce their chemical use in producing such tomatoes. So for tomato, the chemical usage per uh, square hectare in, two, in 2004 was 17, and it had already dropped to nine in 2016. So we see that if we want as an industry to move towards a more sustainable production, where we can use less and less chemicals, we need to make sure that we are breeding varieties for this aim specifically. And at Doom and Orange, this is our ambition. So we are focused on creating resistant varieties to contribute to a more sustainable production. And before we can look into how technology can then help in this breeding process, we do need to understand first how breeding works. Um, because breeding and the, the domestication of plants has basically a very negative um, impact on, um, uh, on the botanical gene pool as it is, because we are actively decreasing the genetic variation. So when a uh, general breeding program starts, you start with a gene pool with lots of variation. And that's what you see here on the left. You see a botanical gene pool with plants that vary in their sizes, in their shapes, and in their colors. So there's lots of variation, but there's also lots of variation that the consumer is not interested in. So the breeders in this case are very specifically selecting for plants that are fitting this consumer preference. So in this case, they are discarding the plants that are not fitting the profile and they're continuing with plants in this case the circles that are yellow orange and pink 
And by doing this for a number of generations, by selecting only for those traits or characteristics that the consumer is interested in, we saturate to end up with a final commercial gene pool that is saturated really for those traits. So you see the final commercial gene pool is saturated for the shapes, circles, and the colors, yellow, orange, and pink, which is lovely because that's exactly what the consumer is interested in. But what if suddenly a virus starts threatening the pink circles while the green ones from the botanical gene pool were resistant? Or what if consumers suddenly start preferring squares rather than circles? Now, if you're using a classical way of breeding, you need to go all the way back to the botanical gene pool to take those plants that have the traits that you have lost during domestication and bring them back into your commercial gene pool. This is a very time consuming um, enterprise. It's very costly as well. Um, so that shows that making sure that as a breeder, you keep the desired level of genetic um, diversity in your breeding program is crucial to react quickly to changes in uh, consumer preference and in market trends. Now, this is also what we have seen in tomato breeding. So in yet another graph, you see the genetic diversity on the y-axis. And again, having genetic diversity is crucial for a, uh, a good breeding program. And breeders during the domestication program have been focusing on very specific traits, thereby reducing the genetic diversity until they finally hit rock bottom. And it's nice because you're very specifically pinpointing to a very specific trait to fill the consumer needs, but you're stuck then in that specific part of the consumer preference. So what tomato breeders have been doing, they've been bringing back new genetics, new plants, fresh blood into the breeding program, and they've been able to curb this effect, increasing again the genetic diversity and being able to uh, steer again into new trends and new direction of the consumers. Now at Doom and Orange, we are trying to make sure that we are preventing that we hit this rock bottom and we are curbing the, uh, the decrease of genetic diversity in our breeding programs. So now we know that um, how, how breeding works and that breeding is crucial for, resistant, uh, for um, focusing on resistance traits. Um, and we also know that if we have to bring back new traits into the breeding program, this is very, cost, very costly. But there are many game-changing technologies available that can help us in this, uh, in this endeavor in making sure that we are keeping the genetic diversity at a healthy level, but also bringing back new traits that we already lost during domestication. And some examples that we can use are, for instance, we can use a lot of software solutions that help our breeders to select the, the best plants with the best breeding, um, uh, breeding potential without those plants looking the best um, at first sight. So, for instance, if a breeder is trying to create um, cut flowers that are taller, then by default you would you would assume that you need to, to select the tallest plant in your greenhouse to start crossing for the next generation. However, we also know that a, a trade like plant height is very much dependent on the environmental conditions, right? Whether a plant was in the right place in the greenhouse, whether it got sufficient um, light, which we already uh, learned today, the right nutrition, right water. So a plant that has a specific height does not necessarily also have the best genes for plant height. And having software solutions will help your breeders to select the plants that have the best genes for specific traits without that being visible at first sight. So software solutions are a very important tool that we can use. Another very important tool that you see more and more breeding companies adopt is using molecular marker selections to reduce cycle time. Uh, with a molecular marker is basically a sort of GPS coordinate that we can use um, to select the best plants based on their DNA profile rather than the, the appearance that they have in the greenhouse. So we can take a small leaf sample of the plants that we have in the nursery, we can send it to the laboratory, and just two weeks later we have any kind of trait that we would like to read as long as we have developed the right tools to read that DNA. So you have to understand that our breeders, they have to select new plants in the nurseries, thousands and thousands of plants on an annual basis. So they don't have the time to really spend 
enough effort on each individual plant. So if you know that a very specific DNA result will lead you to plants that live up to your golden standard as a breeder, you can very quickly discard those plants that you're not interested in. What is then very important is you do follow up all those trials with controlled greenhouse um, experiments. In this case, you see our phytopathology bioassays, where we are exposing our plants that um, are supposedly resistant to a specific pathogen, and we make sure that we try to make them very sick so that we validate the results that our laboratory was giving us. What we also need are, for instance, cell biology experts. They help us to make sure that we are able to make crosses with botanical species to bring back all those traits that we lost from botanical species. So sometimes we would like to take a resistance or a specific trait from a species that under normal natural conditions wouldn't really cross with our commercial varieties anymore. Um, but using really a lot of TLC on the plants in a cell biology laboratory, we can make sure that the first hybrids will survive and we can bridge the gap from one species to the next. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, but the one that I would like to end with is we can use machine learning algorithms to create beyond our imagination. And I think that is one that is very interesting, um, especially linking that to consumer preference, because the orchids that you see here morphing from one type to the next, none of them exist. They've been created by a very modest machine learning algorithm that was trained with just a couple of commercial varieties that exist. And what the machine learning algorithm then does, it fills in all the spaces that we don't see in our commercial varieties, but that biologically could be created. So you could take those models and you can take them to your, con to you, your consumer or to the grower and probe what the preference would be long before we generate such a plant. So you can use that information to really pinpoint your breeding efforts. So we now know that resistance breeding is a very important for living up to our sustainability initiatives. We know that for breeding, you need genetic variation. Um, and we also know that technology can help in the breeding programs. But when we were looking at our breeding programs within Duman Orange, we, we realized that for some traits or some characteristics that we're breeding for, we've made amazing progress. While for other traits, we seem to have hit this sort of glass ceiling that we don't seem to be able to break through. And by analyzing these problems that were occurring uh, in our breeding program, we decided that we need to make a matrix of our traits. So we said we need to look at whatever we are aiming to do, and we have to realize whether a trait is common or rare, or whether a trait is simple or complex. Now, if I start off on the left side, a common versus a rare trait. A common trait would be a trait in which we see a lot of variation already in the commercial portfolio. So if you would take a catalog of any breeder, um, a common trait would be something that varies between one variety or the next. So in a cut flower, it could be the plant height, it could be the vase life, um, leaf color, plant habit, flower type, anything in which we see a lot of variation, you could consider a common trait. And with such a common trait, you can expect gradual improvement in your breeding program. So if you're trying to breed a taller cut flower, you're just selecting the tallest ones in your greenhouse, um, you cross them and your next generation will be slightly taller and then again taller and then again taller. So you see gradual improvement um, over, over time. But a rare trait is a trait in which we don't see variation in our general commercial gene pool. We only see those traits present in very unique uh, sources. Now, these could be uh, resistances to specific pathogens, but it could be anything. It could be uh, day length neutrality if your, your crop is not at all day length neutral, or it could be drought tolerance or a unique color that is not present in that, in that crop. So anything that is really unique to that uh, to that crop and if we would add such a trade to that crop it would really revolutionize um, the market it would be market game changers so that is looking at your trades as to whether they are common or rare and on the other hand we look at our trades as to whether they are simple or complex now a simple trade is a trade that is 
driven by a very few genes or few spots on the DNA. Um, we also know that a very simple trait is not impacted or very over has little impact from the environment. So that means that a very single spot on the DNA would determine what a plant would look like. We know that many resistances, for instance, work in that case. If you have the right gene for a resistance, resistance a powdery mildew in rose, for instance, it works that way. We know if you have the gene, you're resistant. It doesn't matter whether you grow such a variety in, uh, in South America or in Africa or in Europe, a resistant plant is a resistant plant. However, a complex trait that is determined by hundreds of, of spots on the DNA. And on top of that, often the environment plays a huge role in determining such a trait. So vase life or plant height are very complex traits. And we also know that um, if you have a variety, it does matter whether you grow such a variety in South America or in Europe. The plant height or the vase life, they might differ. But that makes progress on such a complex trait for a breeding program very difficult. Because if you're trying to select the plants with the best phase life, how do you know whether those plants had the, the right phase life genes or whether they were just in the right place at the right time? So by creating these different classes, we are able to create a matrix that will help us prioritize um, one, pro one trait over the next and will also help us in determining which approach we should be taking in solving that problem. So for that, um, for solving these problems, we were able to develop a dual approach in creating um, new solutions for our breeding programs. So on the other hand, we have solutions for simple, rare traits, and on the other hand, we have solutions for complex and common traits. If I'm talking about the solutions for simple and rare traits, um, we are looking for unique new traits for a selected number of crops in which we aim to introduce disruptive traits. And if we're talking about determining the priority for such a trait, our global product managers are responsible for assessing the industry, finding um, which pathogens, for instance, are causing the, the, the biggest drops in value in the value chain. Pathogens that will um, create major losses, or pathogens in which we have huge costs because of um, chemical use or uh, integrated pest management, or also pathogens for which the chemicals have already been banned and no solutions are available. So that is how we prioritize the resistance genes. This is really very close to our uh, customer, uh, the growers. Resistances and traits that we are developing in such a way, um, they follow a path of um, identifying the resistance, understanding the genetics, and bringing that to the market. And varieties that we create in this way, they are launched under the Intrinsa label. And I would like to come back to that later to explain a little bit more in detail and how that works. But first I would like to go to the solutions for complex and common traits, because I think that is at least as important as the resistance breeding program, because here the communication and close understanding of our consumers and of the global market trends is actually crucial. When we are talking about the, the, the specifications uh, of the expectations of what we think plants should, should be behaving like, many of those traits are very complex. And we're talking about um, the, what, I, what I already said, the, the plant habit, the vase life, many different um, leaf variegations I heard today. All of this is extremely complex, but we would like to have a better control over where a breeding program is headed. And that's when we need solutions uh, so that we can move away from breeding uh, in um, making use of serendipity, but really focusing our breeding efforts and steering it towards a very specific outcome. So we make use of software tools that will help us breed for very specific genetic gain. Um, what is really nice about using such software tools is that it's modular. So you can apply it to all your crops. It can be applied from big companies to small breeding companies, from huge crops to smaller crops. Any breeding program will, uh, will benefit from using ba basically big data solutions in breeding. 
um, you just determine yourself as a company where, how much resolution you put into the software system and how much gain you're getting out. And if I need to explain a bit how this works is um, you have to consider that a breeder is creating a specific variety for a specific market. And at the, at the tip of this, um, so the, going, um, going towards the, the ideal variety is more or less like climbing up a mountain. And on the tip of the mountain, you have your ideal variety. And usually breeders are creating multiple varieties for multiple, mar multiple markets. So you would have to see that there are multiple mountains with multiple ideal varieties at the tip of the mountain. And breeders are climbing multiple mountains at the same time. So it could be that a rose breeder would be creating a red rose for South America and a white rose for Europe. And every tip of the mountain has very unique specifications of what that ideal variety would look like. When you're using conventional breeding, you're following this gray path up the mountain of your ideal variety. And this is a wobbly path. So like I said, a breeder is creating thousands and thousands of seedlings every year. Um, sometimes a, a new seedling that the breeder is creating is going up the mountain, so it's better than what is already on the market. But very often you take a big step back and you're actually creating plants that are not better than what is on the market, and then those plants obviously get discarded. When you are breeding for genetic gain, so you're using software solutions to select your, your parents for the next generation in a smarter way, you're basically walking up that mountain in, in a much steeper, much steeper path where the, the steps and the increments are much steeper. So that's a very important um, change in the way that we are breeding in the ornamental industry, but it also shows that getting the right consumer information is, very, is really crucial because we're investing a lot of time and effort to climb up this mountain. But what if we get the tip wrong and we're suddenly somewhere we don't want to be? So we think that um, we've heard already today that there are a lot of um, gaps that we still have in how we are getting consumer information from the market and getting that onto the breeders uh, greenhouse floor and into the growers floors because we need to make sure that we're getting this tip of the mountain right. Um, so that's for solutions for complex and common traits. Now, I'd like to go back to the intrinsic varieties that I started off with earlier. I'd like to explain to you a little bit more about how this works. Um, so in our, our general intrinsa breeding pipeline, looks like this. We start off with the resistance identification. So our researchers are in touch with gene banks across the world to make sure that we have lots of genetic variation in our greenhouse. We have a huge collection for all the crops we are interested in developing resistances for so that we can screen those botanical and wild sources for unique resistances. We do that in dedicated bioassays under controlled conditions, and we are exposing all those plants to the pathogens we are interested in creating a resistance for. So if we are interested in a resistance against a virus, we are creating loads of virus particles, and we're really exposing our plants to those viruses. And then we are studying the reaction of the plant to the different, uh, to the virus that we have introduced. And then once we have identified that unique plant that shows exactly the response that we're interested in, then we're going to develop the molecular marker tool for molecular breeding. So that means we are going to study the DNA of that plant to understand exactly what part of the DNA of that plant is responsible for this ideal reaction that we're interested in. Once we have done that, then the predictive breeding can start. So then our breeders start crossing with that plant and they are using this molecular marker really as a navigation tool in their greenhouse to target exactly which plants harbor the resistance and that those are the ones that they should be continuing with. So this is not genetic modification. You just use your, your DNA really as a navigation tool. Then once we have created a commercial portfolio that we are sure has a resistance, we do have a final validation in the terms of um, a, a confirmation essay that we also do with independent institutes and researchers, so that we really have the industry standard stamp of approval to make sure that our resistance does exactly what we promise it to be. 
And then finally, we are ready for the market launch of this new variety into the market. And we really see that the industry is very excited about this. We've already had um, pre prestigious awards and nominations for our Petunia series that has a resistance against the tobacco mosaic virus. And, but the TMV resistance is not the first one. We have a dedicated um, technology program focused on identifying resistances and developing molecular markers for that. Um, so the things that are going to come for market launch in the very near future are, let me just click there a bit, um, white rust and fusarium resistance in the cut chrysanthemums, uh, powdery mildew resistance in calanchoe, uh, TMV and petunia is now already on the market, and powdery mildew resistance and agrobacterium resistance in rose are also upcoming. And then following up all those resistances, we have a very strong pipeline of other resistances that are uh, now still under validation. So we really see a lot of buzz in the industry that this is something that uh, will make a, a big change in the way that we are growing our varieties. So I hope I've given you a little bit of insight into the technologies a breeding industry can adopt in responding to consumer preference. We really think that we're still in the beginning of probing the, uh, the consumer preferences and the, the market trends. So we really embrace any collaborations that, that we can do to, uh, to expand our knowledge, to make sure that we are developing exactly the right varieties. Um, and for Duman Orange, the, the path for sustainability is very much through resistance breeding. And, uh, and this is our biggest ambition. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tosca. That was really uh, amazing insight into how um, the breeding program is developing uh, so uh, rapidly to tackle these issues and, 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 uh, and through the tools that you're using to be able to speed that up. Maybe if there's one question, I could take a question. If anyone has, Mike here. Mike for Mike, please. Any, any breakthroughs on insect resistance? Yes. Um, insect resistance is actually um, in the, the matrix where we really don't want it to be. So it's a rare trait and it's complex. So we have to tackle that through a combination of uh, different approaches. So we are following the, um, the, the solution that we're using for complex traits, but we're combining that with molecular insights. So we're using the, the path of genome estimated breeding values, which is basically the max we can do on, uh, on insect resistance, but that's definitely the, the best way forward. But that takes a bit longer than once you take something rare, you can just take it from one species and put it in the next. So the path to it is a bit longer. Okay, thank you. Um, one, one final one here, please. Dan? Another trait is water use, I guess. I, I was wondering whether you can influence that with genes or not. Water. Sorry? Water, what? water, water use. use. Uh, yes, um, I, I think so, um, especially when we are looking at specific genes that we know from, uh, from tomato. There are some, some genes that have already been described that can, um, that can help a lot in, in water use efficiency. Uh, you could also focus on uh, diff uh, different root systems. So when we use hydroponic systems, we can measure much more easy, uh, easily in our breeding program how the roots are built. Uh, so those are solutions that, that you can do there. Yeah. Great. Right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let's give a Tosca another round of applause. Thank you very thank you. much. Thank you.